So uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, something that we wrote in our collective. It's called Klima Visa. It's a book about new big opportunities for the climate movement here in the Czech Republic. And uh, I think I was invited here because it's actually quite close to something you would call a transition project, uh, maybe. Although at the time when we started, I didn't know about transition design at all. But uh, somehow it, uh, it worked out this way. Uh, maybe just to give you a brief introduction, I'm a designer who works in a design studio. Uh, and I have experience in uh, UX design, service design, product design. Uh, but uh, I've also doing, uh, been doing some things on the site, such as Klimavise. Um, so what is it? Uh, this is uh, basically the cover of the book. Uh, it's, uh, for those of you who don't speak Czech, maybe I should translate. Uh, it's called uh, six areas uh, on which we need to focus when solving the climate crisis, which is pretty much the contents uh, of the publication. And uh, when we are working on it, uh, we called it our common research, uh, which will help us find new big opportunities for the climate movement. And uh, basically, it was a collaboration uh, between designers uh, and people from the Czech climate movement. So basically, we had a team of two designers. We had three climate activists on the team and one person with uh, both the grounds, uh, who is also here today. Um, and maybe the big question is why did we actually create this? Uh, because in the Czech Rep Republic, uh, in 2021, when we started out on this project, it was more or less obvious that we would step back from uh, using coal here in the Czech Republic. So the date was set for, uh, I think, 2033 or 31, something like that. And the big question was, what comes next? Uh, because there was a very strong climate movement uh, with uh, lots of active people. And uh, it sort of needed inputs on what to do next uh, after coal is finished. And there was also a big gap in continuity because of, of the pandemic, uh, because the climate movement here, I think, uh, is very based on personal contacts. So when COVID came, it was difficult for those people to meet. Uh, and there was, there was this gap, as I mentioned. Uh, so the goal for us uh, was to find maybe strategic opportunities that uh, organizations, collectives, people could uh, focus on uh, after coal was done. Uh, and for me, uh, from a designer viewpoint, this was all about using design or maybe something you would call design research to find the strategic opportunities. So what I like to do today in the 20 minutes I have <laughs> is to look at our methodology. Uh, how did we write the book and the way we uh, approach the research? Uh, and then maybe we can look uh, a bit at what this has in common with transition design. But I think uh, actually, Actually, I'm really glad that I'm the last speaker because uh, everyone who came before me pretty much uh, explained uh, how does this tie into transition design. So my task in this will be pretty easy. Um, so yeah, uh, I want to show you mainly the methodology today. Uh, so let's take this as a showcase of how design research or maybe research in transition design can look. Because as everyone before me mentioned, it's not typical design research. It's a little bit different. And uh, we had to tweak the usual way of doing it a little bit. So how did we approach this? Uh, you probably know this. It's the double or triple diamond, which is a classic in all design methodologies, I would say. Uh, and what's, uh, what's maybe obvious at this point, but I think it's important to say that our project effectively addressed only the first two diamonds. The third one, that hasn't happened yet. Uh, and uh, in a minute, I will speak about how it might happen. But uh, let's look at the first, first two ones first. Um, so the very first diamond, it was about forming our intention. Because uh, at first, we had to unite about what we wanted. And uh, it was actually not that easy. Because at the beginning, we didn't know that we wanted to write a book. The output was not really obvious. And our goal was not to. Uh, not to say what the output should be, but maybe what the outcome should be. Uh, that was more important to us. And it was also necessary to kind of form the team because uh, I think most of us, there were seven people in total, and I think most of us uh, knew each other more or less, uh, but we weren't really close friends or close colleagues or anything like that. And we also had different backgrounds. So we had designers with all these 
fancy double diamonds and their methodologies and uh, maybe sometimes rigid ways of doing stuff. And we had climate activists uh, who are, from my viewpoint, uh, how would I say, they're very agile in their way of thinking. Like, they're really impressive with uh, maybe stuff they can come up with, with a quick thinking. Uh, and I think designers are like this sometimes, but also sometimes not so much. <laughs> So it was important to uh, maybe get, uh, get ourselves into one spot like mentally and get used to each other. Uh, I also want to mention some methods that we used in the first space because uh, all three of them were very important. All three are from kind of different backgrounds uh, and all of them helped us a lot. Uh, first of them was a Wardley map. I'm not sure how many of you know the method. Okay, so like two people. Uh, <laughs> it's a method for business strategy. It's, uh, it's kind of weird, actually. I'm just going to be honest about it. Uh, but it's really useful because uh, it allows you to map really complex topics, uh, for example, like climate change, uh, on different axes. One of them is evolution, and the other one is uh, how basically obvious or how transparent is the topic uh, related to, for example, climate change. So when we did the map, uh, effectively, uh, we had a map of topics we would address in our research. So there are some really obvious ones like, uh, I don't know, coal or, uh, or drought, or things that come to mind quickly when you think about climate change. But then there are topics like universal basic, basic income or uh, uh, maybe things related to social movements. And uh, this way, uh, we realized that the scope of the research was going to be really broad. Uh, it was definitely not going to focus just on typical climate topics, as you would think. Uh, and uh, it really helped us uh, think about the research maybe a little bit out of the box than we would otherwise. Uh, the next one was actor mapping, uh, which was basically a mapping of uh, people who know about the topics that came up in the Wadley map. So this way, we had like a database of people that we could contact in our research and that we could speak to, uh, which was really useful because we also found out that uh, we have complete blanks on some of the, of the topics. I think uh, the team was really strong in uh, having many different connections to many different people in different areas, uh, but we also found out that uh, with some topics, we have no idea, uh, no idea who to get in touch with. Uh, and the last one that's... Uh, maybe also a typical design method, uh, was the Lean Canvas. And uh, that actually helped us frame the project itself. So how did we know we would succeed? Uh, what are the outcomes that we want? What are the metrics, maybe? Uh, but you can notice that it definitely wasn't the first step uh, that we did. And this part alone, it took about three months. Because there was a lot of like stepping around and not really knowing what we are doing, not really knowing how to, how to do this. But in the end, all three of these methods really helped us uh, shape what the research would look like. Uh, and then there was the second diamond, the research itself, uh, which basically had two lines. Uh, I think I'm going to start with the top one, which is basically a cooperation with uh, experts. Uh, so the core of our research was shaped by 20 interviews with experts from different areas from the world map. So it was uh, sociologists, politologists, it was uh, journalists, it was um, climate experts, and so on. Really, lots of different areas. Uh, the interesting thing about these interviews was that we had to be really flexible about the questions, which is, uh, again, something you do a little bit in typical design research, but maybe not so much. So we had like a set part of the script for everyone, and uh, then we had to prepare for the interviews and adjust the second part of the questions uh, based on the participant we talked with. Uh, so basically it took a lot of preparation. Another thing we didn't do, and which is probably typical for all design projects, is that we didn't pick 20 people at the same time. Because <laughs> that would, first of all, it would kill us. <laughs> Second of all, uh, there was no point. Uh, because uh, if we pick 20 people at the same time, I think the book and its contents would be totally different. Uh, so we took five people in the first, uh, first round, five people in the second one, and so on. And this way, we could decide on uh, what participants we wanted next. Because in the interviews, so many new topics uh, that we 
wanted to explore uh, came around that we really ne needed to think about which people we want to interview. Because uh, very soon we started running, uh, uh, running into the problem that there, was, there were so many inputs and so much data uh, that we knew that we were kind of uh, coming to our limits as to what we could process as a team uh, because there are really so many inputs. Uh, and what was maybe interesting about the interviews was how we did <coughs> the analysis and the synthesis. And this is where we reached the transition design part. Uh, I think that maybe some of you know this model. It's the iceberg model from Donella Meadows, a uh, uh, person uh, who pretty much came up with the concept of systems thinking. And this is something that might be quite useful for your transition design projects because uh, this model, uh, and I think it's pretty much very similar to the MLP model that showed up before today. Uh, this model asks you, asks you to connect events, uh, patterns, structures, and mental models. And events, that's the part you can see, the part of the iceberg that is visible. Uh, so that's basically what happened, what's happening, what are the newspaper headlines. Underneath that are patterns, what's been happening, what are the events that keep popping up all the time. These point to some structures, uh, so what explains these events, uh, that can be rules, norms, institutions, values, policies. And underneath that uh, are mental models, which are some deeply held beliefs or assumptions uh, that drive behavior. And uh, I think if you're thinking about transition design or uh, uh, systems change, uh, you need to focus on what's below the water. So basically not the events, but uh, you're going to be very much interested in structures and you're going to be interested in mental models. And uh, by looking for the solutions or the questions which are beyond here, you can actually find the spaces for a systemic change. Um, so back to the analysis. Uh, I think what's important to say is that we all did it together in workshop form. Uh, something I specifically didn't want to do is to just uh, leave it to us designers because in a topic such as this, and I think I do have some knowledge about climate change topics, but it was really complex and we really needed to uh, utilize everyone from the team because we had the design expertise and the others, they had the climate change expertise. And uh, if we try to do it just as designers or just the climate activists, it would probably be a little bit crazy. And <coughs> at some point, we would probably give up. <laughs> so uh, first of all, uh, we analyzed the topics uh, that came up in the research. Uh, and then we placed them into the levels of the iceberg. And that's what made the research really click. Because this way, uh, Obviously, most of the topics that came up were in the structures and the mental models, uh, which for me was uh, also a kind of a verification that we were doing something right, uh, which was also nice to have at this point. And this way we could structure uh, the data from the interviews so that we wouldn't completely drown in it. So the iceberg model definitely helped us a lot. And if you're doing a transition design research, uh, this might actually also help you. Uh, so I think the analysis was actually made much better by this. Uh, if I go back to the last slide, uh, there was also the line uh, where we researched the movement itself. Uh, at first, uh, it wasn't really our focus, uh, but when we were thinking about how to do, let's say, a strategic document uh, for the movement, we also had to research uh, how does the movement think about strategies? How do they work with it? So we did a couple of things. Uh, first of all, we did focus groups uh, with uh, about eight organizations from the climate movement. And we asked them, how do you work with your strategies? Do you have any at all? Uh, what kind of troubles you run into when you try to, try to use them? And this was a really important input for us uh, when we were actually writing the book because <coughs> this way uh, we could actually um, personalize it uh, so that it would be the most useful for most of the organizations. Sorry. <coughs> uh, 
<coughs> we also did some questionnaires, uh, which turned out to be not so useful maybe for us, but it was also useful as sort of a verification. Uh, because the questionnaires showed us that what are the topics that uh, the climate movement uh, thinks about and what are important to them. <coughs> so this is what we ask about, like, what do you perceive as the important topics to you? And again, there was some uh, overlap with uh, what we were researching. At the same time, we didn't get uh, so, many, uh, so many answers that the questionnaire would be reliable. But it helped us in some way. <coughs> The last thing we did uh, was a webinar, uh, not the one mentioned here with abroad, uh, but we did a brief webinar with the movement itself that was uh, right before we were moving into the part where uh, we were writing the actual book. And uh, this kind of served as our prototype at this point. Uh, because we are not sure uh, how the publication uh, should be shaped, and this webinar helped us a lot because we again got some inputs from the actual people who would be reading, reading the book, who would be working with it. Uh, and again, it, uh, it helped us make uh, the book better. What is not shown here uh, is the actual writing process of the publication, which was quite something. Uh, it took us about three months. Uh, and wow. <laughs> uh, what's important to say that this was uh, like a community job. Uh, like, if it was just me, if it was just two people, uh, it never would have existed. Uh, so, what I think uh, is another good takeaway for your transition design projects is that uh, maybe it's good to have a bigger team. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, that was the second diamond. What about the third one? Um, Uh, for us, uh, this will be workshops uh, with the organizations from the climate movement who want to use our book to shape their strategies. Uh, our research has discovered opportunities and possible leverage points. Uh, as I said, there are six total areas on which they could focus on uh, if they want to have uh, maybe some impact. Uh, and we also wrote down the possible leverage points, which will tip the entire iceberg model. Uh, so we have five workshops uh, that we are planning so far. Uh, we still haven't done a single one, so I can't really tell you uh, how this will go, but we're all uh, very much looking forward to them. Uh, and I think this will be uh, the most important part of the third diamond. Uh, what we're also doing is we're currently making a toolbox of methods it's uh, really mixed. Uh, some of them are used more in activist circles, I would say. Some of them are design ones. And uh, <coughs> we plan to use those methods during the workshops. Uh, and uh, if it all goes well, uh, it will also be freely available to anyone who would like to use Klimavisa. Uh So hopefully this will also uh, not limit the research to people who can get in touch with us as the facilitators of the workshops, uh, but hopefully it will empower them to kind of do it themselves, uh, which would be really nice and uh, which is uh, something of a vision that uh, we had at the beginning, maybe. Uh, and yeah, uh, I think it's uh, important to mention that we are definitely using some of the transition design uh, methods in the toolbox because they fit in perfectly with the topic. Like if you want to create your own strategy uh, as a climate organization, then for example, the theory of change is a perfect thing. It's difficult to facilitate. Uh, it might be difficult, for example, for small, smaller collectives to use it, but as a tool, it's perfect. So it's just a question of how to enable them to use it well, basically, for their purposes. Um, from my personal point of view, uh, I think it's uh, actually up to the movement to design the transition. Uh, we can supply the data, uh, we can inf inform them what the best possible decisions might be, uh, and we can definitely help them. Uh, but uh, I think right now we're at the point where uh, Klimavisa is out in the world and we'll see how people use it. But uh, personally, I see uh, so many exciting possibilities there because uh, Really, the research uh, uncovered a lot of them. 
So that also might be an interesting input for you uh, on how to do like some sort of collaborative transition design. Because uh, as I showed you on the diagram of the three diamonds, uh, there are actually multiple places where we uh, couldn't do it ourselves. Uh, from the team itself, uh, which was combined from designers and climate activists, to all the points where we uh, had to actually go back to the people from the movement so that this whole research, this whole thing uh, would be valid. Uh, so I think that's one way to uh, maybe look at how collaboration in transition design can work. So yeah, uh, to sum up, I think there are really so many opportunities for transition design, especially in climate and social movements. I mean, I think every talk today uh, showed us that this is the case. Uh, and we need them more than ever, <laughs> which is also obvious. So uh, if this feels like your thing, um, I think that transition design really doesn't have to stay just in the academic or in the theory. Uh, maybe you can contact some of your friends, maybe you can contact some of your local groups, NGOs, and think about how design or transition design <coughs> specifically could help them. Because uh, Personally, in the beginning, I was a little bit skeptical how people from the climate movement uh, would accept design and if it, would useful, if it was useful for them at all. Uh, because I think that uh, social movements in themselves maybe have a lot, uh, a lot of methods, a lot of approaches in common with design. So I was thinking uh, maybe I was trying to uh, give them something they're already using. But uh, it seems that this is not the case. So uh, it turns out that our toolkit, that our mindset as, as designers can really be useful. And uh, I think at the end, people from the collective, uh, from our collective, from Klimavize, really appreciate the design inputs. So this is something that was really said uh, during the retrospective we did uh, at the end of the phase when we were writing the book. Uh, so. I think what I want to say is uh, let's use these methods uh, that we have as designers under our belts to help out because our skills are needed. So yeah, that's it. Okay, Tesla, thank you very much. Are there any questions on Tesla? Okay, Alma. <laughs> this, this may be a silly question after all this things that you were talking about, but what are the six areas you should be thinking about? Well, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will try to name them. If I, uh, if I forget one, uh, Anna, who is sitting in the back, can actually tell, <laughs> tell you what are the areas. She's also holding the book if you want to see it. Yes, I would uh, love to see it. <laughs> uh, sorry, it's only in Czech, but uh, we also have it available in the PDF so you can yeah. translate it somehow. Okay, so... One of the er uh, areas is power and uh, how power dynami dynamics uh, actually influence uh, and influence like the climate movement and uh, uh, climate change. Uh, one of them is uh, strategic mm, uh, con connections or something. Yeah, alliances. alliances. That that might be the good word. Uh, there was a chapter about institutions, uh, which was really depressing. Uh, then there was... Uh, uh, just transition. Just transition, yeah. And mainstreaming of climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's not only one topic, uh, or it's like a complex topic. Mm -hmm. uh, and it needs to be... Uh, yeah, you have to work with that, like a, the way to program the mainstreaming. I and mean, swim it. And the last one, actually, the first one is, uh, yeah, it how to achieve the uh, change of the system. Yeah. So the, the first chapter was that actually you need to have some systematic approach to deal with the climate crisis. Thank you. <laughs> so. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Okay. I got a question about the methods you used. Um, mm -hmm. I wonder if you first like decided which methods uh, and you choose the methods, or it organically just came out of the you know of the process and you were you were shaping in a lot of way. It was very organic. 
especially the beginning. Uh, I think the first three months was really the phase when uh, we were kind of trying different things and getting very frustrated with some of them. Uh, but we managed to uh, somehow get over that phase. Um, as for the second diamond, I think the interviews were pretty much set in our minds, uh, but the rest of it, that, uh, that also came up organically. And, uh, you know, there's always uh, one thing, uh, one thing is what you're writing uh, into the different uh, grants, and the other thing is uh, what you then actually do and how you uh, shape it so that uh, you fulfill the things that you wrote into the grant. And, uh, you also try to uh, leverage the things you can do within like this one category of things. So, for example, it was the webinars for us. Okay. Okay. Who is the um, who is the audience for the book? Like, who do you want to read it? Uh, organizations in the Czech climate movement. Okay. So, with it for the climate movement itself, but for, like, yes. give them a kind of yes, exactly. Of okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's basically meant from for for a full scale of the organizations, like from the grassroots ones to the big ones who deal in lobbying and things like that. Yes, Roberto, did you have a uh, moment uh, where you presented this book uh, to, to this organization? If we omitted something, do you, you collect some feedback from the organizations about the about the book? Uh huh. Yeah, uh, so one of the points where we collected the feedback uh, was the webinar, and uh, the book itself was released uh, a month ago, a month and a half, and uh, I don't know, Anna, do we have any feedback from that point? Yeah, we have a lot of feedback, thank you. 